Welcome to the You're Not Invisible After 50 podcast. I'm Kiran Kumar, founder and host of You're Not Invisible After 50. Despite the title, you don't have to be over 50 to listen to this podcast. No matter whether you're 25, 45 or 65, we can all learn lessons from each other to help us build a better, more fulfilled life. Come listen to the inspiring stories of all the phenomenal women over 50 who are kicking ass and making an impact. They are not invisible. I'm not invisible and neither are you. So no matter what society says, life doesn't end at 50. In fact, it's just beginning. Welcome to the You're Not Invisible After 50 podcast. I'm Kiran and host of this podcast. We're all about showcasing phenomenal women over 50 who are kicking ass and making an impact. You'll get to hear all the inspiring stories <laughs> why you don't have to be invisible after 50. So sit back and enjoy the wonderful life story from this week's guest. My guest today is Nancy Papal. Hi, Nancy. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Thank you. And thank you for having me. I'm so excited about this to get into know a little bit more about yourself. So let's kick off. And I'm going to ask you, first of all, to introduce yourself in one line um, to our listeners. I am a retired divorce attorney who spent 34 years taking marriages apart. And in my retirement, I'm trying to keep them together by writing blogs and books about how to overcome those pauses in a relationship that keep you stuck in a place you don't want to be. That's actually an interesting stance. And of course, we're going to go into this in in the body of this podcast. So let's talk about the the podcast. Um, We're going to cover your life story. So we begin at the part in the past. Then we'll talk about the present, what you're doing at the moment. Um, If there was a trigger around the 50 mark, um, and also what the future looks like. So let's kick off and let's start with anywhere you want to begin with regards to your past. But in any event, um, what, I initially became a nurse, uh, a critical care nurse working in the emergency room and intensive care units. And I wrote a textbook with some people from the University of Pennsylvania I was practicing in Pennsylvania at a hospital then. And um, this textbook, Advanced Concepts in Clinical Nursing, was well regarded throughout the United States, incorporated into the curriculum of multiple nursing schools. And also many hospitals changed protocols for better patient outcomes, which is what we were after. But they didn't change any of the protocols that I was concerned about in the particular hospital that I was working at. When I went to the administration and asked them why, because I had sent you know, a, a proposal, it was because I was a quote nurse. And at this hospital, only doctors are the ones who change the protocols. Uh, now this was in the seventies and it was very much still a v- very much male centric uh, medical world. And the doctors were the one with the power So I asked someone who had been um, a nurse before she became a lawyer and came to the hospital and administration to try to address the things that I was trying to address. So I asked her, how can I get them to listen to me? And she said, become a lawyer. You'll have power. (laughs) So I went to law school. I went to law school. I thought, you know, I would do some medical defense malpractice and then go back into administration. As many women understand, in our, because of our gender, life gets in the way. So um, what happened was I did do defense malpractice. And the first day on the job, it was an all male firm that I was hired into. And the first day on the job, there were 75 divorce files. I went to the senior partner and I said, you know, I'm not really interested in doing divorce. I'm going through one myself. I was hired to do defense malpractice. And he leaned over his big, huge oak mahogany, I should say, mahogany uh, desk, put his finger an inch from my nose and told me I had a bad attitude, that I was never going to make it. Well, as I said, I'm one of seven children. I'm the middle. And if you tell me I can't do something, that's when I dig in and do it. 
So I became very successful as a divorce attorney as we were doing the malpractice defense work. When the firm lost the, the contract to represent the physicians, I had a stable of clients from having done the divorce work. So I left that firm, started my own firm, and I, I had my own firm for over 30 years. Now, if you ask, did there something happen in when I was 50? Yeah, what happened when I was 50 was I was very successful, was my second marriage, and um, I'd been married for about 20 years, um, and I got dumped for somebody 20 years younger. Wow. Interesting. <laughs> yeah, interesting. So um, I... I realized how I, I decided then that particularly women, and I was representing women in that age bracket, mm -hmm. whose husbands were leaving, or frankly, they were fed up at that point in their lives and they left. They wanted a divorce and they're the ones who initiated the divorce. So I decided that, you know, in my own marriage, it was, you know, we all have our own history of what happened. My particular marriage, what happened was, to be perfectly frank, I became too successful. Mm -hmm. And that really be became a real issue mm -hmm. uh, in my marriage. And there was no way I was going to crank it down to save a relationship when I was not valued in that relationship. And... I only I felt like an ATM machine. And I, I, I said, I can't I can't do this. And so I left that relationship. Um, and I just feel as if women who are in their 50s and in the United States, you know, you have a 50 percent chance of making it in your first marriage, 60 percent chance. Uh, rather, the failure rate is 60 percent. Um, failure rate in second marriage and 70% failure rate in third marriages. Wow. And trust his statistics. Yeah, that, that's our statistic. That's mm -hmm. not in the UK, but that's our statistics. I think we're the third in the world for in terms of the number of divorces. But in any event, um, I just feel very passionate now that I have the time to think about what really is the number one cause of divorce? Mm -hmm. And other podcasters have asked me that. What's the number one cause of divorce? And I've been researching relationships for over, you know, for 30 years, trying to help my clients, you know, get out of um, the mindset that this is a failure or this is the end. And I came to the conclusion that the number one reason or cause of divorce, and I will say this, I, as I said, I've researched this. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it's, it's singular to the United States. I think broadly what happens is it's not infidelity. It's not sex. It's not money. It's being mismatched in the very beginning. It's not asking the right questions. It's not really completely vetting the person that you think you're going to spend the rest of, the, of your life with. How is it that they, you know, what are their spending habits? Do they agree that you should have an emergency fund? Do they agree that in the United States right now, there's a big bone of contention about Social Security and Medicare? Mm -hmm. I lived in the UK for three years, so I know that you have national health insurance. And that's one huge safety net. Mm -hmm. But in the United States, there may not be a huge safety net when these 20 and 30 and 40 year olds are, are 65 or 70 years old. So what is your, your view? I mean, sure, we're in love. You know, we can't keep our hands off of each other. Everything's hunky dory now. And that's the problem. Um, I don't want to go too deep in the woods about the chemical in your brain, which is dopamine. And dopamine, most of your listeners probably have heard this, dopamine, it lights up the same area of the brain as cocaine. Okay. And so you are so high on dopamine, which only lasts 18 to 24 months. And oh, interesting. When that, 
Yes, yes, you can Google it. <laughs> <It's just true. laughs> no, I mean, I've read all the studies by Helen Fisher, who is a preeminent um, anthropologist in the United States, who did MRI studies on people who were in love, people who were dumped, people who um, were just after having been dumped or divorced, um, were it reigniting their relationships with whoever. And um, she is the preeminent person, I think, in the world about the dopamine, the serotonin, and the oxytocin. Those are the three stages that you go through. But so many people are longing for love that they overlook the red flags. They mm -hmm. overlook the warnings. And so that's that's my mission. I'm trying... Um, I've written a novel which addresses this in novel form. It's called Around Which All Things Bend. Mm -hmm. And love, of course, is the thing around which all things bend. It's on Amazon. Because we've, we've kind of moved on very fast. Um, so I want to kind of go back to the past in terms of becoming a, um, a nurse and then becoming a lawyer, which was a huge step forward. And then moving from thinking that you're going to do malpractice in terms of um, in the medical field, you were going to then, you actually then moved into divorce, dealing with divorces. So how was that transition? I mean, what, what was the trigger? What was the, the kind of impetus in terms of moving forward? What was the reasoning behind it in terms of, okay, I want to do this or I want to do that? The reason why I decided um, not to go to another firm to do defense malpractice, which I had offers to do, mm -hmm. um, but to act, actually concentrate on family law mm -hmm. is because I felt as if I was making a bigger difference in the lives of the people that I was representing than I ever would representing a doctor in a malpractice case. When in my okay. heart of heart, he may or she may or may not have been responsible for the injury that they were being sued over. Mm -hmm. um, my job was to defend them and to get a verdict that said that they were not liable for what they were being accused of. And I was good at that. But I was much better at helping people get on with their lives after divorce. And I was much better helping people transition through the heartbreak of divorce mm -hmm. and helping people basically reinvent themselves after a divorce. Right. Okay. Thank you. You said that as you were becoming more successful, that that was the reason that your mar second marriage failed. Um, I feel that's, that's the case for a lot of women, isn't it? As, as soon as they become successful or are, on that kind of pedestal that men have a difficulty in accepting that, would you say? I would absolutely agree with that. Um, I, you know, I studied psychology, of course, not only in nursing school, but in college. And we all have to have a certain amount of narcissism in order to survive in the world mm -hmm. so that you're going to survive. You have to protect yourself. I think men in general, and I'm not a psychologist, this is my observation after being on this planet for 75 years, being married three three times. My third marriage was the charm, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, I finally met the man of my dreams <laughs> in excellent. any event. Um, uh, but um, I think men become very intimidated mm -hmm. by women who are more successful than they are. My second marriage, it took me a long time and a lot of therapy to realize that it was his his intolerance to my success. Mm -hmm. He would try to put me down so many times in public mm -hmm. and people were embarrassed for me. And I put up with it because I didn't want another, quote, failure. And I've represented some very high power women who were presidents of banks, presidents of corporations anesthesiologists, very successful doctors, researchers. I was, they were getting divorced for the same reason I 
believe I was divorced. Now you could say that's a negative in terms of my life. I looked at I look at it like a positive because if he hadn't acted in the manner he acted in, I would have stayed in that situation. The one positive thing I will share with your audience is that I worked very, very hard myself not to be bitter, but to be better. I just love that. I think well, you're absolutely right because your breakup can be your wake up call. And I think, like you said for yourself, it was for me, it has been. And also, you know, you become better as a as, as a result of something that is quite negative. You don't really want a failure. And I mean, no. I I said to somebody the other day that I believe in marriages. I love. I believe in love and all of that stuff because I'm a romantic, I'm a Piscean. But having been through that pain, I'm much better off now being out of it. And I'm a much better person for it because it just brings you down. Everyone at this point has probably been on a plane where they tell you if the cabin pressure drops, you use the oxygen mask on yourself before you can help anybody else. And that I think you need to stick in your mind when you're trying to decide, shall I end this relationship? Shall I talk to this person about I how my feelings that I want to end the relationship in an effort to possibly, you know, start a conversation that maybe we could, you know, reinvent our marriage, fall in love again. And that's possible. My second book that I'm writing now is a nonfiction book. It's called Mm -hmm. The Malnourished Marriage, Five Essential Emotional Nutrients for a Healthy Relationship. And the purpose of that book is to help people who are really stuck in their relationships to use a different lexicon. Everybody knows about food. People can identify with food. We all talk in metaphors, you know, to show our emotions and these, I use a food metaphor to try to get conversation started. I use communication is equal to water. Water can crash or it can flow. You can't live more than three days without water and a relationship can't last without com- communication. It just can't. No, not, not at all. So it's interesting. So from being a divorce lawyer to now we move into the present where you're actually doing the opposite. You're trying to keep marriages together. So yes. where did the switch come in? Where? How did that happen? Uh, you know, I'm so glad that you asked me this. A lot, a lot of podcasters, hosts don't aren't as insightful. The switch came in about ten years before I retired. Um, And a young man came into my office for a divorce consult, a very attractive young man in his early 30s. And I'm taking, you know, his name is, you you have to take background information. And he said, you don't recognize me, do you? You don't remember me. And I said, no, I'm terribly sorry, I don't. Mm -hmm. He said, you represented my mother in the custody case when my father tried to get custody of me. I looked at him and I thought, when does this cycle end? You know, and and the research is Mm -hmm. that children of divorce have like an 85% higher rate of getting divorced. Because they have yes, they haven't, and that's that's not only in the United States, that's in the UK, Canada. Um, I did a podcast in New Zealand. I mean, you know, it's Children of divorce who have not learned how to problem solve, Mm -hmm. how to resolve disputes, who Mm -hmm. have heard, who have cringed in their bed, listening to the parents argue or throw things. They're going to bugger out of their relationship because they don't know how to resolve disputes. Mm -hmm. And um, I decided that, you know, there's got to be a way that people who are really stuck in their relationship and feel as if they can't talk to their spouse or their partner, there's got to be a way that maybe they can start the conversation. And that's what I'm hoping that this book really does. Um, the, The novel is about if you feel as if you're mismatched, if the red flags are flying, even if it's four days before the wedding, call it off. 
I think that's really interesting because I knew that I wasn't right. My 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 partner that I'm the man I married wasn't right for me. And 25 years later, I divorced him because he wasn't the man for me. And I should have followed my instinct then. And unfortunately, because of external pressures, it didn't happen. And you're absolutely right. If you're not miss if you're not, if you're mismatched at the beginning then there is no point in continuing on. And you have to listen to the signs. I actually say to my children, listen to the signs before you get, you know, before you continue into a a, a deeper relationship. Because as soon as you get one spark of, you know, negativity, you just know that that isn't going to be the case. It's going to, it's going to, you can't change a leopard, I realized. You're, no one can change another person. Yeah. We can only change ourselves. Yeah, and absolutely. That's that's what this book is about. Um, the nonfiction book. Um, if you want to try one more time to try to save your relationship, um, there are there are things, there are springboards that you can start the conversation. Not the same way, not the same language you've always used before. Um, I'm sure your audience has heard of Brene Brown. She's yep. world famous. You've heard of Brene Brown. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Um, in her, you know, in her books, she talks about using a different lexicon mm-hmm. to talk to people, mm-hmm. you know, and that's she, you know, I, I just adore everything that she does. I mean, I uh, watched her podcast, I don't know, maybe 10, 20 times, but um, in her TED talks rather, but uh, I, I, feel that if you could use a different lexicon with somebody who you're really they're not paying attention to you you know you can't go in and say i am and i don't you know want to use any expletives but i am blah 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 sick of this relationship you don't talk to me you don't look at me when i come in the room you're only looking at the computer you're looking at your cell phone you're always late you know blah they're not going to hear you they are not going to hear you. They might as well have earmuffs on. But if you could approach it in a way that even if they're looking at their cell phone and you want to do a conversational gambit to try to see if there's any use in you wasting your precious breath. Hey, you know what? Our relationship is so dehydrated. Mm-hmm. Do you know what? what? Yeah. I mean, if you look at communication like water I think we're both really thirsty aren't we Mm -hmm. I mean there's a way that you might be able to get a little bit of traction there it's hard work it's not going to happen overnight it may seem silly at first but I'm telling you it has worked um I have a website Nancy Perpall p-e-r-p-a-l-l dot com lots of blogs on there I did a series on the on the malnourished marriage five essential emotional nutrients and it was because of all the feedback i was getting that i decided to make it a book okay. so i mean i do get positive feedback on it opens up it mm-hmm. opens up some communication and without communication everything else fails okay and the non-fiction book is out when is that in the work um, in progress it well, it's probably late fall two thousand twenty three. Um, okay. That's my goal. All right. And that sounds really, really good. So, can you just give a, again a little bit more about that nonfiction book that you're doing? Are you writing? Okay, the nonfiction book, the Ma- the malnourished marriage, talks about um, communication is water, protein is sex. Protein, mm-hmm. everyone knows, is the building block of the body, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Sex is the building block of a relationship, right? Mm-hmm. Um, then I talk about trust. Uh, and I talk about trust being like a, a multivitamin. <laughs> because mm-hmm. if you're missing things, your nutrients, you need a supplement. And trust is really the supplement that keeps a relationship together. And then I talk about humor Every single relationship has to have humor, and that's like carbohydrate. Mm-hmm. So I talk about all of these things in terms of how to incorporate them into your marriage as if you were going on a healthy diet. 
Wow, interesting concept. Absolutely interesting concept. So what that actually sticks would stick in your head, right? In terms of how to make your marriage work. And that's what you're aiming for. I also use an analogy. If you're a severe diabetic, you mm-hmm. have to restrict things. Yeah, and absolutely. if you if if your marriage is like really fragile, you know, and it's it's like a, being a fragile diabetic, then you can't do the screaming and shouting like you you might be normally communicating. Um, you can't do you know the turning away or the cold shoulder or the withdrawal that you may have been in a habit of doing. And that's what I try to get to in this book, how to break down those those barriers, those invisible walls that we erect between ourselves and people who are hurting us. We, you know, if you got on a plane and the pilot announced you have a 50 percent chance of reaching your just destination, would you what would you do? I wouldn't get on the plane, to be honest. Yeah. Well, you have a 50% chance of having a successful marriage, Mm -hmm. but we do it anyway. Do you understand? Everyone knows that marriages can break down in every country, on every continent. I don't care where you are. I have represented every color and creed there is. I've represented every nationality, and we all feel the same way. When we feel underappreciated, ignored, undervalued, it wears away. It just wears away our confidence. It wears away our happiness. I totally agree with that because, you know, when I was in an unhappy marriage, I was, well, as I've just said, was unhappy, but also <laughs> I had no confidence. My confidence was eroded. I was powerless. And then coming out of that marriage, because it wasn't to the right person, you have become what I should have been always, this strong, independent person that I was born to be and that was kind of eroded away during the 20, 30, you know, 25 plus years of my marriage. That's what happens. Yeah. That's what happens. Absolutely. um, You know, Again, women, and I'm speaking generally from my anecdotal experience, mm-hmm. women tend to put up with a lot more mm-hmm. than men do in relationships. They're trying so hard to make it work for the children, mostly extended family for this reason, for that reason, a whole host of excuses as to why they shouldn't put themselves first. Let's face it, ladies, <laughs> who I'm really speaking to. Women don't put themselves first. We really do not. Not in a relationship. Even if you've been in several subsequent, you know, sequential relationships, you end up being the one who's probably giving the 150 instead of the 100. That's the way we're made. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Let's talk about the, the bonuses. So we give five tips or you give five tips to our listeners um to anybody who's under 50 what would you what would those five tips be the five tips are the quality of your life depends on the quality of your relationships and that's number one tip so i think concentrating on your relationships and I'm not saying that if you're in a negative relationship, you should stay in it. I think you should avoid people who who make you feel as if you're in a zone of negativity. Mm-hmm. But to the extent that you can cultivate your relationships. The other one is that aging starts at birth. Take care of yourself. Take care of yourself. Because you only are going to have one body. Trust me. You know, um, I'd have, you know, I've always taken care of myself physically and, um, you know, I'm in very good health for my age. What I would recommend, even though I'd like my wine, you know, really be careful with the alcohol. Mm -hmm. Be careful with alcohol. I mean, alcohol has caused so many. the, the, 
the end of so many relationships um, because people say things, people say, well, there's an old wives myth that you tell the truth when you're drunk. But a lot of times it's not the truth about the person that's in front of you. It's truth about what your background was, what your history was, who you were angry with when you were three years old. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. you know, all of those defenses are broken down. So my advice is if you're going to go out for a night and really have a few, don't get into an argument <laughs> with someone you love. It, it, it's it's going to devolve into something. You can't take anything back. And again, this is the concept of, you know, a healthy diet. I mean, you're out for the evening. You're, you know, you're, you're imbibing a little bit, but, but be careful. Limit it. Don't go overboard. But even if you feel at that point, I think we all feel like, wait a minute, I think I'm really getting drunk. Mm -hmm. Just keep your stop. Up. The stop. <laughs> Um, is that your tip three or is that tip part of tip two? That was tip three. Tip four has to do actually with abusing drugs. And mm -hmm. that's a huge problem in the United States. I think it's a huge problem everywhere. And that's all I'm going to say about it. Again, okay. it's it's a corollary, corollary to you've only got one body. Mm -hmm. You start aging at birth. And mm -hmm. really, in the name of all that's holy, please do not. The recreational drugs are out of control. And I'm just saying, stay away from them. They're not going to do you a favor. And the fourth one is get an education, whatever your passion is. Mm -hmm. Do something that you're passionate about. Even if people who are your parents or friends don't agree with what you're pursuing. So that's my tip five. Oh, you said tip four, but that's tip five. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Tip four yeah. was don't abuse drugs. Okay. And tip five was... Okay, fabulous. And what about the three tips you'd give to anybody who's over 50 and listening? Um, I think the biggest one that I would say, and this is based upon a Harvard study that was done in the United States over a series of like 30 years. Um, you really, loneliness kills. Loneliness is, can, can be toxic to your emotional and physical health. And this, again, is a tandem to what I said earlier. It's all about staying healthy. The, re the quality of your life after 50 very much depends even more so on the quality of your relationships. So as I said, you know, I am really a social social media phobic, but I am I'm going out there. I am on social media. I'm on Facebook. I'm on Instagram. I have a website, none of which I really want. But if I were just sitting in my study, just with my study doing podcasts, I'd be nowhere. Mm -hmm. So I'm just saying lonely, loneliness kills. And as actually this was one of the number two was the quality of relationships. I already said that one. And number three is I think even after you're 50, if maybe you're retiring or slowing down, find something. Again, we're talking about find something you're passionate about, whether it's you know, volunteering, whether it's finally writing that novel or the memoir that you've always thought about writing, make yourself productive. Don't just sit there and veg, you know. That's I, think it's, my tip. I, think, I think that's really true because I think the narrative and the kind of societal, societal narrative is that, you know, as you're over 50, you're retiring. You look at the images, it's of people who are really old at 50 plus, but I'm 59. I don't see myself as that. And I just think, you know, I started a podcast at 58. I started a business at 58, you know, um, I'm going to do my next thing when I, you know, just before my 59th birthday. So I think, it's because the narrative has been that always, but it's about changing the narrative because your life doesn't end till it ends. And if you have your health and you have all your wits about you, then what's stopping you from going after whatever you want to go? And this is what we're about, right? This is what this podcast is about. This is about what you're not invisible after 50 is about. And also what I'm going to be launching next week is about. So it's about changing that narrative and saying, hey, regardless of your age, go for it. And don't sit back. It's a choice. 
It's a choice. If you want to sit back, that's fine. But if you want to do something, here's the permission. Here's your permission to do it now. I absolutely. I I can't imagine having lost um, the desire to get up in the morning and be productive. I think I'd be, you know, being on the golf course didn't do it for me every day. Yeah. And mm-hmm. I did try that, by the way, but it didn't do it for me. I still felt as if I had something to contribute. And each and every one of us has something to contribute. And each and every one of us has a story. And if you're 50, perhaps you have a child or children or even grandchildren, and they deserve to know your story. So even if you don't think you want to publish it, I highly recommend that people start to write what their passion in life, how, where did they, how did they get, just like you, what you're doing, just what you're doing now. Pretend you're in this podcast, write about what was your background, what was your history, what motivated you, what do you think in your personality that kept driving you forward when people were pushing you back? And trust me, I was pushed back all the time when I first entered that courtroom. Mm-hmm. I was called names that I won't repeat. I was given such a hard time. Um, you know, yeah. I don't even want to go into it. But again, I'm in the middle of seven kids. And I learned, you know, I learned at daddy's knee to push back. Mm-hmm. But because I was a girl, I had to do it in a certain different way than mm-hmm. a male would have done it. But in any event, um, I think life is too short. This is not the dress rehearsal. This is it. This is Absolutely. it. And it's interesting what you just said, Nancy, because um, on the reflection of what I've just said, in terms of, you know, going for it, writing things down, because this is what we're about. I mean, if when we, when, you know, when anybody goes, that's it, it's lost. All those lessons that you've learned, all the stories that you've got to tell, they're all gone. Whereas if they're captured in some format, it's for the next generation. And really, this is one of the reasons why I'm doing what I'm doing, is that I want to change the narrative for other people who are coming up behind me. Because as you said, you're aging from birth. People think that as you age, you age when you're 50. But hang on a minute, you age on the day you were born. And you're even if you're 48 today, you're going to be 50 in two years time, right? So that's what it's about. Her, yes, absolutely. You know, it's about this podcast. Thank you. It is. It's about this podcast and the, the change that we're going to have in the future for other people coming up behind us. That's what it's all about. Absolutely. And this is the way we capture people's, women's voices so that we educate and support women who are coming up, and um, as I said, behind us. Well, thank you very well, much. I've always oh, been sorry. a proponent of women. I've always been a mentor and proponent of women. I feel very passionately that women truly, I mean, if we were in charge of the world, there would be no war in Ukraine. There would be no Brexit. There wouldn't be half of the problems we have, you know, but in any event. Well, so. who knows what's going to come in the future? We're hoping oh, to change. We only yeah. pray. <laughs> Absolutely. In the positive way. Well, thank you very much for your time today. And thank you for your insight and giving us, you know, a view of relationships. So thank you very much, Nancy, for your time. Well, it was a Total pleasure. I very enjoyed chatting with you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the You Are Not Invisible After 50 podcast. If you want to hear more from some amazing women over 50 who are kicking ass and making impact, then don't forget to subscribe to our podcast available on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Remember to rate, comment and share with other fabulous women. And together, let's change the narrative that you don't have to be invisible, no matter how old you are. Check out our other services on www.yourenotinvisibleafter50.com and follow us on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn and TikTok. And always remember that life doesn't have to end at 50. In fact, it's just beginning.